Well done for staying to this point. I really, really do appreciate it. And it's really important for our presenters of the three minute presentations that you are here. So we're going to watch some three minute presentations. Some of them are live presentations. Some of them are video presentations. And people are very kindly prepared three minute videos and we're going to project them onto the screen and watch them. So we're going to intersperse them with some video and then presentations. So the first one is a video. And it's been made by Julia Petty, Rebecca Thomas, and Joy Jarvis, and is digital storytelling in nurse education, creating and telling stories to engage learners in the classroom. Digital storytelling has the potential to meaningfully capture participants' experiences and share them in a highly engaging manner. It combines the art of telling stories with a mixture of digital media, including text, pictures, and audio narration blended together to tell a story that revolves around a specific theme. In this case, the theme is that of the parent experience within one specialty of children's nurse education, neonatal care. In line with what Gazarian calls narrative pedagogy, listening to digital stories from parents in our care enables us to learn from their experiences. Stories can not only engage and motivate the learner, but also can lead to greater understanding, compassion and empathy towards patients, carers and parents. The question, therefore, is whether they have the power to enhance empathic learning. Many frameworks exist for digital story creation. Here, the Aspire model is applied to the creation of digital stories based on parent experience from the neonatal unit. A. The aim was to educate learners in this field about the emotional experiences of parents. This empathic learning is essential in order to give more person-centred care. S for storyboarding. Parent interview narratives were reconfigured using core story creation to form a plot known as narrative emplotment, which brings the elements of a story into an imaginative order and a meaningful whole. After condensing into short scripts, key metaphors were extracted to form the basis of the stories, each lasting three to four minutes. P. The population is student nurses and health professionals within neonatal care, or such individuals who emotionally support parents as part of their role and practice. I implementation involves the storyboard template, including the script, voice narration, selected text quotes and pictures, being constructed into a digital format to create a video as the final product. R is release of the videos, which enables them to be showcased within the classroom on a one-to-one -one basis or small group basis or online. And E is evaluation from those viewing stories, allowing feedback to inform future digital story development and enable adjustments and improvements to the materials. E is also for engagement. By engaging with the narratives of parents, these can inform the content of digital stories. And by engaging with these digital stories, learners can in turn come to understand the emotional experiences of parents, which can impact on the care that they give. In other words, knowledge about emotional experience learned through digital media can be translated from the classroom and into practice. Super. And can we ask Julia, Rebecca and Joy, just stand up and take a little bow. Well done. Where's Joy as well? There we go. Super. Thank you. So now we move to a live presentation. So I invite up onto the stage Diane Murad and Thomas Baker. And they're going to be talking about joining the dots, creating an environment where the unmotivated don't exist. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> I... I'd like us to think about some of the paradoxes that exist in higher education. We have to deal with the balance between attainment and transformation, where the pressure to award good grades potentially conflicts with facilitating individual learning at the psychological, convictional, and behavioral levels. We also have students who share just about everything on social media, but lack security to the extent that they are risk averse with an overwhelming fear of failure. And the guided learner journey 
which potentially and possibly unintentionally creates a one-size-fits-all route to education, which is particularly tempting when you're dealing with large groups, is at odds with transformative learning, which is based on equal participation in discourse, autonomous thinking, and discovery. So let me ask you a contentious question. When did you last facilitate learning instead of spoon-feeding content? And I think when we look further into kind of how that happens, me and Diane did a lot of talking in terms of actually looking at the wider prospects in terms of how we educate rather than how we teach. And that facilitating of learning looks at the holistic development of the students that we then become part of in terms of their journey. And we use the analogy a lot when we talk. If you think Google Maps or Apple Maps trying to be um, diverse, if we give our students that destination in terms of where they want to end up, there are already pre-existed routes of that, how they might take to get to their destination. However, we're talking about how to create that environment where they actually create their own route they take. Sometimes they may have to circle back once or twice to go down the same route they've been down before, but now they see learning as different when they first took, took the first journey down there. So then how can we be in a situation where we don't limit ceilings, we create robustness and adaptations for the dynamicness that they might have to take when they go into industries like business and, and sports coaching. So then how do we go down the route of that autonomous learning, the behavioral change over a period of time that then allows them to develop the competencies and complexities to deal with the capabilities of the nature they're going to go into? How can we create those industry-ready people that are happy to take that guided learner journey further into lifelong learning with the wider skills it takes for them to do so? Well done. Excellent timing. Well done, team. Really good to think about those questions. So now we go back to a video. I have to thank Emma and James for being fabulous all day, but also for this bit as well. They're going to be chopping and changing between different elements. This is a video I've made which explores how we've used the value-added data as part of a project to stimulate inclusive practice changes. This short video has been developed to provide an overview of how we've used value-added data to stimulate inclusive practice. We are one of six partners in a HEFGE Now Office for Students funded project to think about how we can reduce the attainment gap between white students and students from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Previously, we've only been able to look at attainment data at institutional or school level, and we've been considering the percentage of students who've achieved a first or a 2-1. But this data has not taken into account entry qualifications. Through the work of Kingston University, who developed a value-added metric, we've been able to take these into account and statistically compare with the expected attainment value with the actual attainment. And we're able to put this information into what we call value-added databases and dashboards. And we're really grateful to Nick Page from Student and Information and Planning who's done this and has put our dashboards into the software tableau. So within the charts, we can see the green lines where we have a value-added score of one, where students have over-exceeded what was expected based on their entry qualifications, and red bars where students haven't achieved what would be expected based on their entry qualifications. What's good about the dashboards is we can look at every single program, undergraduate program within the university and we can compare this over a number of years. So we can see differences between different groups of students at program level. Working with program teams at workshops, we've invited them and helped them to look at their specific data and to identify if there are any attainment gaps between white and BME students. We've then asked them to think about their curriculum and to think about principles of good practice in inclusive teaching and provided some suggestions of how they might think about making their curriculum more inclusive and discussing race within their curriculum. We then followed up and met with programme leaders to develop case studies of good practice and these are available on our LTIC study net site. Some of the actions that programme teams have included are things such as challenging module leaders to review their reading list to include more BME authors and to include more case studies and materials that are representative of their student group. We've also seen programme teams recognising the importance of unconscious bias workshops for their staff and also how the confidence of a programme team has developed to enable them to talk explicitly about race with their colleagues and with their students. 
So finally, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Nathan Garn, Judy St John, Amanda Yip and Nick Page who've worked with me on these activities. Okay, next up we've got another video, and this time we thank Andrew Burgess from the Learning and Teaching Innovation Centre, who's created a video about using a smartphone to introduce video into the learning experience. My video presentation today is about the use of smartphones as tools for creating and sharing media within a learning environment. This is the Nokia N93, and this was one of the first devices to feature both a camera and a phone. It's interesting to consider how quickly things have changed in such a short period of time, in terms of both the technology itself as well as its proliferation and adoption. It is also interesting to imagine what things will look like 12 years from now. Using my own smartphone, I have recorded and edited together a series of interviews and conversations different educators. Unfortunately, I'm limited to a time constraint of just three minutes for this presentation, so I'm only able to share a few short snippets. In the third year of our Master of Pharmacy degree, I had what was called by the students the module of doom, because the students really found it a challenge, it was more of a contextualised module, they had to critically evaluate material, and so the students would go through the module very frightened about it and yet at the end of the module they would have really enjoyed it and actually found it a great learning experience. So what I wanted to do was to capture that student experience to help other students who were going to be starting on that module. And I simply just used a smartphone to record a student who had gone through the module and to share some of the top tips for how to manage the module, how to approach it, and how to survive it. And the students really found this very valuable and it was much better hearing the advice from another student rather than me simply telling the students what, what I want them to know. So our students are asked to create visual presentations also entirely out sometimes on their iPads or smartphones. And they would use particular pieces of software like um, Adobe Spark or uh, Microsoft Sway software. And in doing this, it allows them to work directly with frame grabs um, or particular kind of moments or film clips themselves. And the film clips that they're working on um, allow them to kind of record analysis with their own voice or use successive images um, in a storyboard or have written pieces of text that are offered as analysis actually layered on top of the images themselves. And they can actually be quite creative in um, the ways in which they can engage with the text. Creating video content on your smartphone can provide additional access points to other materials that you'd like students to engage with. You can simply record a verbal explanation to provide additional information about a concept or an idea or instructions for an assignment or what students need to do with various materials. For, for us it's been a great way of binding people together. Yeah. And we're not changing our practices, we're doing the pedagogically sound things that we know work. Mm. But I think mobile phone technology and video helps us to do that in a more immediate or profound way. Um, where I think, I think if students visualise things, learning, depends on your learning style, but you know, yeah. visualising things I think really helps to consolidate things. Andrew, stand up and take a bow. He's chatting. Andrew, stand up and take a bow. I think we can see who the expert in our team is in, in terms of video production. Next up, we've got a live presentation. So we welcome up Mariana Lilly and Ghani Nash. Neil's distracting at the moment, but <laughs> they're coming up. So Mariana Lilly. OK, are you sure? And Mariana is going to speak about higher apprenticeship pilot in computer science. 
Um, thank you. So here today to share some exciting pilots between the School of Computer Science and Deloitte. So essentially Deloitte has a program called Bright Start where they recruit school leavers and these school leavers work for Deloitte. And what they wanted was to provide these school leavers with an opportunity to study for a degree. And our university has a great computer science degree and they chose us. And this is when things became tricky because the office is in Belfast. Guess what? We are in Hatfield. And the idea of um, having these students commute from Deloitte, Belfast to Hatfield wasn't working very well. So what we did is we got really creative. And what we have done is we have worked together with Deloitte and we are using our online distance learning program to allow these Bright Start students to study for a degree and work at the same time. Uh, the way it works, um, these students are on live projects with real Deloitte clients from Monday to Thursday. And on Fridays, they have a, a safe space within the Deloitte offices where they can study. They have mentors on board. And the reason why it's working really well, there's a very good partnership between academic staff, Deloitte and students and so far it has been the best of both worlds for the students who are with us. Uh, we have the second batch of students arriving in September and this is the quote from one of our students who joined us September last year. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, Mariana. Great to see one of our new programme developments and programmes apprenticeship schemes up and running. So we go back to video now. And, and next up is a video from one of the hardest working people today, Andrew Piper. I can't see him. Where is Andrew? There he is right at the back. Andrew has uh, put in, I think, about eight different abstract submissions for this conference, has done a huge amount of work, has facilitated workshops, has created videos, has done presentations. So well done, Andrew. Here's the first one of his videos. And this is a video from Andrew with Jennifer Gutridge and Kevin O'Connor making use of the KWL framework via a web application. basic implementation of the KWL framework um, and you can see it's fairly open the components of the framework are represented here so you have um, what the student knows what they want to learn and what they learned and the framework requires a certain kind of process and so the idea is that the students will post what they know and want to learn before they're able to study um, the actual session or uh, the demonstration or whatever it might be and then then they can then once they've done that they can then post what they've um, learned about the subject um, but clearly at the beginning of the process um, they're not able to study the demo or, or post what they've learned um, and the intention is that the the they follow this fairly loose uh, structure um, which begins with the introduction, um, setting out the task of, of, that the students are expected to engage with. And here it's a demonstration of um, a concept classroom. And the aims of the study relate to um, the opportunities and constraints it places on um, whether or not uh, on educational technology design. And so here the student would be expected to say, well, what do you know about that already? And so I'm just going to put in some placeholders so we can actually progress through the the, the framework and um, so uh, what I want to learn and two and again just placeholders but now the the demo is open so I can actually study what's going on and here the intention is to study the room and to um, identify those kind of constraints and opportunities I mentioned before for the implications for educational uh, technology design and pause that now. And having studied that, um, the, the learned part of the framework is open now. And so I can recall the aim, uh, aims of the task, which is set there for the students. Um, and also the, what they wanted to learn is also represented here as well. So they can link back to both the aims of the task and also what they wanted to learn. And obviously that gives them um, the opportunity to reflect on the extent to which they've actually learned what they wanted and uh, fulfilled the aims of the task. 
and and then if necessary then go back and uh, perform the um, process again or um, then they or sort of come to a conclusion they have understood but at least they've kind of gone into that th thought process where they've thought about you know, what they've learned and and how they can represent that um, and that's basically it that's the uh, basic variation of the, the KWL uh, framework. Thank you. So we've got Kevin at the front. Kevin, Andrew, I, I don't think Jen's here, is she? I've not seen Jen today. She's on holiday. Lovely, thank you. So next up we've got Andrew again, but this time Andrew's video is about structuring students' reflection on video feedback using an annotation tool. The purpose of the annotation tool here is to um, allow for the use of video and audio and the benefits that that provides in, in providing feedback, but also to support students in both their ability to annotate specific points in the video um, and to structure their note-taking uh, process. And in this case, the annotation tool is designed for feedback, as I said. Um, so you have different categories that um, the tutor might choose um, and potentially one development will be that students can then add their own as well, but that's for future work. But in the to-do uh, to item is something that the student's being asked to do or something they log themselves in response to what they see on the feedback. Um, the query is when they're not sure of something that's being said in the feedback and they need to follow up with uh, the tutor. And a bug is when there's a problem with the software and uh, they need to kind of see where the problem lies and what the feedback is for that problem. And QDOS is when things are going well, and it's important to log those too, of course, I mean, to, so the, the student knows um, what they're doing well. And effectively, that gives uh, the notes, notes on this side, um, which provides a, either a structure for the uh, student to then kind of write up potentially a report if, if the tutor has asked for the student to kind of note down what they're going to do in response to the feedback. Um, that's one thing, it can, you can just copy it and then paste it into um, a word processing program or some other editing tool that's more appropriate for a full-on report. But if it's just for a point of reference as you work, you can also use it that way. So you can click to the problems or the items that you've, you've logged or the notes, and it will show you the point in the video where the, the uh, issue or the note came up. And just to show um, a query, for example, um, So I'm just going to ask for clarification. You can see the video was paused and then it's posted in the appropriate place. So this is kind of a time, uh, time ordered set of notes. And so the upshot, the, the intention is that at the end of it, as I said, the, stu the stu students have um, a kind of a, a, an easy to use um, set of notes um, for how they're going to work with them. So now we go back to a live presentation and Neil has been scurrying around handing out bits of paper which will become obvious. So we welcome Neil Rickers from the School of Education who's going to be th thinking about instant formative assessment without the need for student devices but using clickers. Is this one working? Yes it is, thank you. So if I could have the world's worst slide up on the screen, that would be great, please. Um, yeah, apologies. Uh, I appreciate that is a horrendous slide, but I need to show you lots of things. So I'm going to be talking about clickers, and this is a way for you to get feedback from students without the need for them to have their own device. So all those issues around the Wi-Fi falling over, batteries not charged, just can't be bothered to get it out of my bag, all of those things go, and it works by the little bit of squarey shape type thing most of you have got in front of you. Each of those is unique and whichever way you hold it, one of four ways, that corresponds to a response to a question and you'll notice there's a tiny little letter next to each of those four responses and whichever one is pointing upwards that is your response to the question. What's great about those letters being so small is that only you 
and myself as a lecturer know how you've responded. So some of the problems about having a nice ranking leaderboard as you might get on something like Kahoot suddenly don't become an issue either. So we are going to do a live demonstration. My fingers are crossed for this. There's a question in red on the board. It's the kind of thing I'd expect my trainee primary teachers to know as they have to know about how computers work nowadays. And your four options are, which of these is a service provided by the internet? A, the World Wide Web, B, kitten pictures, C, text messages, or D, satellite TV. So I will fire up the Plicker app. Because I knew I was going to ask this question, I've already entered the question into my device. But I could have also done that on the fly just as I was speaking to you. So I will scan the room with my device. Well, I've already got a few right answers. There's a lot of wrong ones, uh, which is interesting. I won't, um, I won't name and shame, you'll be pleased to know. Now, the cards you're using are the largest version, and they're suitable for a lecture theatre of this size. If you were in a normal size classroom, you could use ones about a third of this size for them to pick it up. And that's not too bad. So there were 40 uh, responses. I will press uh, the tick and that's them presenting me with a graph very similar to the one you can see on the far right of where you are standing. Now for those of you that are interested, the answer is A, the World Wide Web. The internet and the World Wide Web are different things. The internet, think of it, of all those computers connected together communicating and that provides services such as web pages, the World Wide Web, video on demand, email, all those kind of things. Satellite TV, works over satellites, as the name suggests, rather than the internet. There is video on demand via iPlayer, for example, but that's a very different technology. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, I've got 10 seconds left. It's great because you can also track students over time, so I could assign one of these plickers to you for the whole academic year and then see how you were getting on. And if you were constantly not quite understanding, we can maybe do some little intervention and see how we got on. Five seconds over, sorry. Well done, Neil. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Back to our last video. So this is a video about the initial evaluation of the use of targeted educational anatomy and physiology applications on classroom engagement and exam performance for first-year undergraduate paramedic students. And we thank Teresa Groves, Anthony Herbland, Phil Withers, John Tolbert, and Catherine Young for this video. This presentation is an initial evaluation of the use of targeted educational anatomy and physiology applications on classroom engagement and exam performance of first year undergraduate to paramedic students. So two anatomy and physiology apps were introduced in semester B to our first year paramedic students with the aim of improving classroom engagement and exam results in a subject that can seem abstract. An online survey was conducted to make an initial evaluation of the use and value of the apps as electronic teaching aids. So the results of the evaluation. The online survey was open for three months. Several invitations were sent to the first year paramedic students, but only eight responded, corresponding to 12% of the cohort. All the students acknowledged the educational added value of these resources and they would all recommend the apps for next year's first year paramedic cohort. The apps seemed more relevant for the anatomy teaching, however the survey suggested that they are equally important for the physiology teaching. And the apps were used equally on desktop PCs and Macs, so 45%. Um, and on mobile devices such as iPads, iPhones and Android devices, 55%. Knowledge and skills development. The students identified the apps were most useful in terms of identifying the gaps in their knowledge and as a revision tool. They also identified their benefit in other modules on the paramedic programme. However, it was noted that they had less pedagogical value for developing their practical skills. App functionality. Students really appreciated that the information could be easily found and they found the 3D animations were very useful. However, some students identified that the speed of loading the apps was an issue. 
level of engagement. Overall, the students interacted with the apps significantly more before their exams compared to during term time and their placement weeks. So the next steps for the team. The apps will be integrated into the teaching of anatomy to the new first year students in semester A and further evaluation will take place using an online questionnaire, um, focus groups and triangulation of exam results to assess the value of the tools for teaching of anatomy and physiology in paramedic science. And again, if we've got Teresa, Anthony, Phil, John and Catherine, would you like to stand up? Oh, there we are. Excellent. Well done. And our last three minute presentation is a live presentation and we welcome up Shannon Rock from the Learning and Teaching Innovation Centre. And Shannon's going to talk about widening access and outreach, their innovative sessions and academic involvement. Uh, there. Have you got one there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, like Helen said, um, I work in the uh, on the widening access side of the widening access and student success team. Um, you might also know that as widening participation uh, or uh, outreach. Um, so our team, we work with 28 local schools across Hertfordshire. Um, targeted schools uh, to do what it says on my slide here to raise aspirations in young people, uh, encourage progression after compulsory education and hopefully to be as fun and engaging as possible. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways. We go into schools um, and we run a lot of sessions within schools themselves, um, but we actually run a lot of uh, sessions and if events at the university and on campus um, and to do that we, re we rely a lot on uni uh, university staff across across the university and um, particularly academics if we're if we're looking at doing taster sessions so I just wanted to give a couple of examples really um, where we have done that um, and where it's been particularly enhanced by technology um, so the uh, top middle picture there where you can see kind of all the lights um, that was done on a creative arts uh, taster day and so that was light trails, so the students were able to use uh, photography, and it's something they would never get to do uh, at school, so it's really kind of showing them the opportunities that are available outside of school and after compulsory education. Um, another session we did on that Creative Arts Taste Today isn't actually on the slide, but it was a virtual reality painting, so the students were able to um, wear VR headsets and paint a virtual space, um, and again, something they would never get to do at school or necessarily know uh, was available to, to do. Um, uh, another event of ours, uh, we uh, did a, an event in February where we ran lots of different um, academic taster sessions in lots of, so it wasn't a subject specific day, um, it was more of a variety. But one of the sessions um, was with computer science um, and Pepper, the robot, which is pictured uh, on the left and on the right hand side there. Um, and so Pepper was pre programmed with lots of questions um, that students were able to go and ask. And I mean, their faces just lit up that they were able to ask this robot questions and it was able to communicate. Um, so it's amazing to kind of show these opportunities. And we, we're like, we really appreciate um, all the input that we get from staff across the university. It really enhances what we do and it makes it that bit special. Um, so really, I guess I just wanted to kind of draw some attention to some of the things that we do um, and also encourage uh, as many of you as possible to, to work with us more. We would absolutely um, love that. So I guess I'm going to use my last few seconds to say that if you do want to find out more about what we do, um, if you want to get involved or know the impact of what you have done with us, if you have worked with us before, um, it would be great if you wanted to come along to a networking lunch with us that will be in a couple of weeks' time. So well, I've got some of these to give out to you, and if you wanted to find out a bit more about what we do and uh, come along and just have a chat with us, that would be amazing. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you to everybody who presented or created a video. I think it's just amazing how much information we can convey and how much discussion we can stimulate with just those three minutes. So important for us to think about as well as we develop our lecture capture software pilots and, and we develop lecture capture and recording more within the university.